không đó Hi everyone. Morning. Good morning. <laughs> right. Good morning. Good morning. I don't think I've met. I guess we'll wait two minutes for more people to log on. Um. How's everybody's week going? Good, good, thank you. And yours? Good, thank God. That's good. Yeah. Okay. In a minute. Okay, I think we'll begin. Um, it is 1030, so we'll start. Um, I hope everybody had a great week since last time we were together over Zoom. Um, so we're up to the third lesson of this course. And um, I mentioned last week that this week we're going to be discussing the a topic of tzedakah, of charity. Um, and so we know that this is a major Jewish value. There's a lot of emphasis in Judaism on giving tzedakah, on giving charity. And we're gonna delve into this topic. There's a lot to talk about. And um, of course, if anyone has any questions or ideas they'd like to share, I love um, interaction. So if you want to use the chat or unmute yourself, please feel free. So we'll begin with um, a question that King David asked God. The, Mid the Midrash says that King David questioned God and said, God, why did you create inequality in the world? Why did you create this uneven um, distribution of wealth where we have, some people have way more than they seem to need and some people have way less than they need. And why did, he says, God, why did you create rich and poor? Why didn't you create everyone equal? And we're going to go into this topic more and we're going to um, arrive at the answer to King David's question. Um, but let's open up and see, does anyone have any ideas? Um, why do you think, um, what comes to mind when we think of why would God, what was the intention of creating, you know, inequality in in, in wealth and any ideas? There's no right or wrong answer. It's just uh, to open the floor to discussion. Yeah, Roseanne, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I just have to unmute. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Um, maybe to teach the world compassion Exactly, for sure. Myra says in the chat to keep people working and keep people charitable. Yeah, these are all great ideas, definitely. And we're going to explore this more. Um, we're going to understand the Jewish. We know that Judaism puts a big emphasis on charity, on tzedakah. Um, the Rambam actually writes that in his Code of Jewish Law, he says that he's never seen or heard of a Jewish community that does not have a um, charity fund for the people in the community that need. So throughout history, 
Jewish communities have always implemented a charity fund. Um, part of the purpose of a Jewish community is that we all come together and support one another. And there's, um, you know, people are looking out for those in need and um, there's a fund and there's options for people that need, um, need support. Um, and something interesting that I recently read is that the, if anyone's ever heard of, um, it's called the Philanthropy 50, something, I'm not sure exactly the title, but it's basically a, um, they publish annually, they publish the top 50 philanthropists in um, America, um, the biggest donors, people that are giving the most charity. And of the 50, 19 of them were Jewish or are Jewish. Um, and even more interesting is that of the top six, five are Jew were Jewish, which is a huge number considering that we are such a small percentage of the population. Um, it's a disproportionate amount of um, charity being given is coming from um, Jewish, which is really incredible. And it just emphasizes even more um, this idea that charity is really essentially um, a Jewish value. It's something that the Torah and the Jewish use to the world. Um, and so we're going to understand not only the spiritual significance of charity, why there's so much emphasis on it in Judaism, but also, of course, the practical um, aspect of charity and what it means for our lives. Welcome to everybody who just joined. Um, thank you for joining. And we are discussing this topic of charity for everyone who just logged on. Um, so the Talmud says that charity is greater than all of the other mitzvot combined, which is a really fascinating statement that charity is, you know, as important as all the other, we have 613 mitzvot. So that means it's really, really important that it's, you know, as important as all the other mitzvot combined. And the Talmud also calls charity the mitzvah, meaning like it is the epitome of all the mitzvot. And we're also going to understand why that is. Um, so the first, we'll begin with what charity is not, right? Charity, we think of it, the word charity implies that it's something um, extra. It's something wonderful and out of the ordinary, something that is a beautiful thing to do. But according to Judaism, charity is not um, charity, actually. The word tzedakah in Hebrew does not mean charity. We loosely translate it as charity, but it actually, the word tzedakah comes from the word tzedek, which means justice or righteousness. And so we loosely translate it as charity, but in truth, um, tzedakah means justice. And the difference between the words justice and charity is that, like we said, charity implies that it's something superfluous. It's something that is going above and beyond. It's like someone who gives charity is so virtuous. But Siraka justice means that it's just the right thing to do. It's just the way it was meant to be. Um, and so they have very different connotations. And um, we, we, this lesson is going to kind of reframe our mind to understand that charity is not um, this like optional extra thing that a person can do. It's actually part of the framework of who we are, of this world. Um, and it's like an essential component to our life as Jews. Um, and what we consider being justice um, and the right thing to do. So with that in mind that, you know, tzedakah literally means justice and not charity. So obviously it's easy to use the word charity because it is familiar to us, um, but really tzedakah has a much deeper meaning. Um, so we're going to start with the Rambam, who was the main codifier of Jewish law and his um, understanding of tzedakah and what he says tzedakah means. So according to the Rambam, the purpose of tzedakah is to provide the needs of the poor person, of the person in need. And the Rambam quotes the verse from the Torah where it says that a person shouldn't harden their heart to the needy and we should open our hand to the poor. 
And the Rambam says, what does this mean? That when a person is um, approached by a poor person, a person in need, when a person, um, you know, happens to meet somebody that is in need, we are obligated to provide this person with whatever they need. And so this has two connotations. Firstly, that it's dependent on coming across a poor person, meaning unless you come across somebody that is in need, you don't have the obligation to go and seek out someone who's poor. The, the Rambam's understanding is that when a person meets someone who is poor, or if somebody asks you for a donation, we're obligated to give to them what they need. Um, and also it's dependent on the needs of the, of the receiver, meaning whatever the person needs is what you're obligated to give. Of course, you have to have that amount of money um, or means, but it's very much dependent on the needs of the person. It's, the focus is giving the person what they need and their, um, whatever they're lacking. Um, and so this is, there's two, we're gonna understand two aspects of Sidaka and these two ideas, but from the Rambam's perspective, and you know, this idea of tzedakah, tzedakah is responding to the need of the poor person. If somebody is in need of something, we have the obligation, according to the Torah, to respond to that need and give them what they need. Um, so on the other hand, on the flip side, we have a, the biblical commandment of miser. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. It's the concept of tithes of giving 10% to charity. So we'll understand some of the background in this. Miser, the word miser comes from the word eser. Anyone knows that account to 10 in Hebrew? Eser means 10. And of course, miser is giving 10% to charity. Now in biblical times, there were three types of miser that could have been given. Um, so we'll go through all of them. The first one was called Miser Rishon. And this was 10% um, of the produce from that year had to be given, separated and given to the Levium, to the Levites. So this is, Miser was very much an agricultural commandment. It had to do with giving of um, that year's harvest. And so the first 10% had to be given to the Levites um, who were working in the temple. Um, the second type of miser was 10% that was removed from the produce. And the person, the owner of this was obligated to go travel to Jerusalem and they could partake in these, um, this food, but it had to be in Jerusalem. Um, and the third type of miser the third type of tithes um, was another 10% that was only given in the second and sixth year. Because we know that the, the um, agriculture in Jerusalem, the way it worked, I mean, in Israel, in biblical times, according to Torah, every seventh year is the sabbatical for the land. And the farmers, the Jewish farmers, were not allowed to work the land in the seventh year. And so it went in a cycle of seven, seven years. So every second year and every sixth year, um, the farmers were obligated to give 10% to charity. 10% of their produce went to um, a, a person in need. Um, the interesting thing is that instead, it was instead of the second miser. So instead of taking that 10% and eating it in Jerusalem, it was donated to charity. So every year there were only maximum two tithes being given. I hope that makes sense. So we have the first 10% was given to the Levites. The second 10% was either eaten in Jerusalem or it was donated to charity, depending on the year of which year they were in. Um, and so this idea of miser, of giving to 10% is actually in many ways, it's the opposite of the tzedakah that we spoke about earlier. Because the Rambam's perspective on tzedakah, like we said, is responding to the need of the poor person. Whereas miser is dependent completely on the income of the person that is giving. So if somebody has more produce, then their 10% is gonna be more than someone who has less. And so it was completely dependent on the giver. 
and how much they had. Um, and so tzedakah, when I say tzedakah, I'm referring to the first the idea of giving to the poor, of providing the poor person with their needs is a reactive commandment. Whereas miser, um, giving the tithes, the 10% is proactive. If a person didn't come across a poor person or didn't know a poor person, they were obligated to find one. They had to go and seek a person in need and give them that 10%. It didn't matter if they were approached, if it didn't matter if they knew someone in need, they had to go and actively find someone um, to give their 10% to. Um, so these two concepts, we have tzedakah on one hand, which is providing the needs of the poor person and miser tithing, which is giving of our own 10%, represent two different sides and two different perspectives of charity in Judaism. So like we said, firstly, um, tzedakah is responding to the needs of the poor person. It's giving them what they need. What does this mean? The Talmud says that if a person, well, the Talmud asks, if a person drops money accidentally um, and a poor person comes and picks up the money and uses it, is that person credited for the mitzvah of tzedakah? Did they fulfill the mitzvah of tzedakah if they had no intention of dropping the money? They had no intention of giving that money to the poor person um, or the per poor person retrieving the money. It was completely an accident. But at the end of the day, the poor person received that donation. So is the person credited with the mitzvah of tzedakah? And interestingly, the Talmud said, says yes, that person is did fulfill the mitzvah of tzedakah, even though it was unintentional. And even if the person was distraught over losing that money, he still fulfilled tzedakah, the mitzvah of tzedakah because at the end of the day, the poor person had his needs provided for and that is the essence of the mitzvah. So according to this, we see that tzedakah, um, from this perspective, tzedakah is very much dependent on the poor person having his needs met. And it doesn't matter if the giver had the intention to give, or even if the intentions were good, as long as the poor person received their needs. Now, of course, um, just a side point, this doesn't mean that intention doesn't matter across the board because intention, of course, matters in everything that we do. Judaism, we spoke about this in the first lesson, how our intention um, plays, or last week, sorry, we spoke about how our intention plays a big part in, um, in the mitzvah that we do. Um, and Judaism does tell us to have proper intentions when it comes to certain things. But what this is saying is that whether or not the person had the right intention, if the money got to the place where it was meant to go, meaning if the poor person received the money, that in itself is the mitzvah of tzedakah. On the other hand, of course, we know that in Judaism, there are different levels of charity and the highest level is giving anonymously because it, it keeps the dignity of the poor person intact and it doesn't embarrass them or humiliate them. And so doing charity in the right way, there's many ways to do charity. And of course there's the proper way and you know less proper ways, which we will discuss. Um, Roseanne said in the chat, if the rich person finds the money, well, then it wouldn't be charity. Yeah, it wouldn't be tzedakah then. Um, this is considering that somebody who needed the money, somebody who was lacking, was able to use it for their own needs. Um, that would be considered tzedakah. So from this standpoint, we see that tzedakah is, the essence of the mitzvah is providing the needs of the poor person. As long as that person has their needs met, the mitzvah has been performed, regardless of the intention. On the other hand, um, from the perspective of miser, of giving tithes, it's actually the opposite. Because when it comes to giving tithes, the intention does matter. And the person has to be giving of his own income. And it differs for each person, like we said. And so the idea of giving tithes is the answer to King David's question, right? King David, we said, asked God, why did you create inequality in the world? Why is there this uneven, unequal distribution of wealth? And the answer, the Midrash says that God answers King David and he says, if not for inequality, if not for having rich people and poor people, 
who would pursue kindness in this world? Who would pursue justice? And the idea here is that without, if everyone were the same, if everyone had the same exact um, means, and it doesn't only mean you know monetarily, it can also be in all aspects. If we were all the same, if we had the same abilities, if we had the same talents, if we had the same, um, you know, if everyone was the same, then there would be no synergy. People wouldn't have what to give to another person. So if I'm the same as you, then I have nothing to provide you with and you have nothing to provide me with. The fact that there is this imbalance in all areas, right? In money, in talents, in abilities, um, th that imbalance gives me the opportunity to give to you and gives you the opportunity to give to me. It creates the synergy between people. And so God was saying to King David, when, because of the imbalance, um, specifically with rich and poor, kindness can be pursued in this world. And this was God's intention. When he created the world, he wanted it to be a place where people give to others, where there is a, a kindness and interactions between people. And when that means that when God gave a person money, meaning somebody has more than another person or somebody has a lot more than they would ever be able to use, it's not because they were meant to hold on to that. It was meant to be given and redistributed to others. And it's it's almost, you know, it's amazing to have a lot of possessions, but this is actually a whole different mindset that a person was given those possessions in order to give to others. It's like God was entrusting them with this unbelievable gift of being able to give to others, which is so much more powerful than just keeping the money for yourself, to be able to be God's messenger in this world. And the fact that God trust, trusted you or with this um, you know, with this kind of success is because he entrusts you to give to others. And so, you know, this mindset is a completely different take on Siraka and it's a completely different take on um, the possessions that we have. Because when a person looks at their, their success or their possessions or their income as being given to them by God, being entrusted with them by God in order to give them the ability to give to others and give them the opportunities to pursue kindness in this world, that is the greatest gift of all because it means that we are all, we are, are all responsible for one another. Like we said, the Jewish communities throughout history have always instituted um, a charity fund to take care of those in need because that's the way God wanted the world to be. It wasn't meant to remain imbalanced. It was meant for us to even out the imbalance and to give to those who need. And so we know that one of these, the big concepts in Judaism is tikkun olam, to fix the world, that God created an imperfect world. And it's our responsibility to elevate the world and to make it a beautiful place. And so the fact that God gave somebody um, a certain you know, monetary success is because he's entrusting that person to fix the world and to make the world a better place by giving to others. Um, and this really changes the mindset around money. It creates a humble, um, sensitive person because money has the ability to inflate someone's ego. We know that someone's money and ego are very connected because when a person has, you know, a certain amount of success, it usually comes along with um, an inflated ego or it could. Um, but this perspective changes that because when a person sees their success, not as my own success, it's not that I was so great. I was able to, you know, achieve all this success and make so much money. It's actually that God is entrusting me with this success in order to give to others, which is a really humble, th humbling thought that, you know, God believes that I can do this. He believes that I can take what I have and give to others. And it's like God is, it's like God's, you know, his bank account is being open to me in order to give to others. Um, so it's a very humbling thought. And it's also a very um, God, it creates a very um, God conscious mindset because when a person sees all of their success and all of their belongings as being gifted to them by God, 
it's not my own thing to hold on to. It is actually my responsibility and my opportunity to give to another person. And so this imbalance that King David was speaking of, of having rich people and having poor people, God says the purpose of that is in order for this world to be a world of kindness, for people to give to one another, for people to depend on one another in a way. Because if I have nothing to give you, then we can't, there's no relationship there because you don't need anything from me and I don't need anything from you. God wanted a world where we can pursue kindness and give to one another. Like I think Erzan, you said in the beginning, when we opened up the question, it's exactly that idea that inequality gives space for kindness because without that imbalance, kindness would not exist. And the idea of tzedakah would not exist. Um, so that was, that is the explanation of why we are here in this world, right? We're here to pursue kindness. We're here to be there for one another um, and make the world a better place. And part of that, a huge component of that is giving charity to one another, giving to those who need, looking out. So both sides, looking out for somebody who needs um, and providing them with their needs and also refining ourself through the act of tzedakah, through the act of charity, refining our own character, becoming more humble, becoming more God conscious um, and practicing the, the pursuit of kindness. Um, so we have both perspectives of tzedakah. Does anyone have any questions before we continue? Any ideas, thoughts to share? Okay, so that is the spiritual significance of tzedakah. Um, we're gonna go into some of the practical applications because we did say that Meiser was um, originally an agricultural law. It was something that applied, first of all, it only applies in the land of Israel. Um, and second of all, it only applies to produce, to farmers. So that would you know, eliminate a lot of us from that, from performing that mitzvah because we unfortunately live in the diaspora and we are, most of us don't have a yearly harvest. <laughs> So the rabbis instituted um, Meiser for nowadays, which is we give 10% of our income. And this applies to anyone, any Jew living anywhere, um, no matter how much. 10% um, of our income goes to charity. Um, and of course, the rabbis didn't want us to miss out on the spiritual significance, the spiritual um, power of giving charity. And so they took the biblical commandment of Meiser and applied it to our days where any every person is obligated to give 10% of their annual income to charity. Um, but this of course brings up a lot of different questions, a lot of different um, halachic um, questions because there are different levels. Somebody can say, you know, 10% is too much for me. 10% is too much of my income to give away to tzedakah. Um, and so, of course, Judaism recognizes that there's a gray area, that there are people, of course, that this would be too much for. So, interestingly enough, there is a fascinating law. Yeah, one second. <laughs> Sorry. Um, there's a fascinating law in, um, in Jewish law, in the Shulchan Aruch, that says that even a poor person is required to give tzedakah. Not only that, even a person who um, is sustained by the charity of others, so somebody who is forced to receive donations from others, that's how little they have of their own, that person is still required to give tzedakah from what they received. So even the person who's receiving tzedakah from others is not exempt from give, continuing to give tzedakah which is really interesting. And I remember struggling with this idea, like how could that be? How does that work? Somebody who has so little, how are they supposed to expect it to give to someone else? Um, we know, you know, in America with taxes, somebody who is, has nothing to give um, is not obligated to give taxes. It's only the wealthy, the people that have enough to be able to give that are really paying a lot of taxes. And so it's logical to say that somebody who doesn't have an income, somebody who's receiving the charity of others is exempt from giving charity. But on the contrary, Judaism says, no, 
even a person who is poor, even a person who has nothing of their own and is receiving from others is still required to take a small portion of the, what they're receiving and continue to give to another person. And based on everything we said about, you know, tzedakah is not only about providing for the needs of others, but it's actually about refining ourself. We can understand how this law can exist because when we give to another person, we are refining ourselves and we are fulfilling our purpose in this world, which is to be givers, which is to be people that pursue kindness. That is part of our mission in this world. And so it's bad enough that this person doesn't have the, you know, their physical needs met, how much more so they should be able to pursue their spiritual needs, which is their purpose in this world to give to others and the opportunity to refine themselves and take part in all of the spiritual advantages of giving charity. And so because God wants us to be givers and he wants us to look out for the needs of another person, even somebody who has very, very little to give of their own is still required to give because they still have the obligation to be a giver. Um, and so the Torah gives a bare minimum amount that they can give to tzedakah. Um, it's like, I think a third of, of the shekel, which is very, very um, small amount, but it doesn't really matter the amount. It's not so much about how much they're giving. It's about the idea of giving, of pursuing kindness and looking out for the needs of others. And it it creates um, a more in tune and sensitive person just through the act of kindness. Um, and that is, like we said, that's how God intended for the world to be. He wants the world to be a place where people are looking out for the needs of others and um, feel a certain responsibility for to take care of another person. Um, so this brings us to, you know, the gray, we're in this gray area discussing different levels of tzedakah. So we spoke about somebody who, you know, is receiving charity from others. That's a very extreme example of poverty. But what about somebody who's in the middle, somebody who is in that gray area of, you know, I'm making enough to support myself and my family, but maybe 10% is too much. Maybe 10% is, um, you know, too uncomfortable for me. And so the Torah understands and um, recognizes that there are different levels and different, um, you know, expectations for each person depending on their level. Um, but what the Torah says is that each person is required to do an honest self-assessment and say, what in my life is a necessity and what in my life is a luxury? And if something is holding me back from giving charity, I have to examine that and say, is this something that I need? Is this a necessity or is this a luxury? And the Torah understands that there are different, you know, there are different lifestyles, there are different levels of this is a necessity or a luxury, something, you know, even as times change a century ago, a car was a total luxury that only the wealthy had access to. And today a car for most people is considered a basic necessity. Um, so times, times change as well as there's differences between people. Some people are accustomed to a certain lifestyle. And so something would be considered an absolute necessity which for another person is a total luxury. And so the Torah understands that and says, a person has to genuinely look at their lifestyle and say, in which areas can I, you know, say this is unnecessary and this can actually be given to someone else. This can um, be for the benefit of another person. And that's from person to person. And that takes genuine, you know, um, self-awareness. And um, I think it was the second Lubavitcher Rebbe actually explains how to do this. And he says that a person, if a person wants to really examine themselves and say, what in my life am I, you know, splurging on or what am I, um, you know, spending time, effort, money on that can actually go to another person. Um, he says to contemplate the position of the person in need, to really think about what they're going through when a person empathizes with the needs of another person and really thinks about how they are lacking in their life 
that will motivate and inspire the person to be more generous and to give to the other person. Um, there's a beautiful quote um, from one of the Baba Charebis that says, in matters, in material matters, right, in physical matters, a person should always look at somebody who has less than them. And in spiritual matters, a person should always look at somebody who has more than them. Meaning when it comes to material things, when it comes to possessions, when it comes to physicality, we should compare ourselves to someone who has less than us. And we should thank God for all of the blessings we have in our life. And we should think about somebody who has less than us and say, what can I give to them? You know, how can I be more grateful for the life that I have? Um, because there are people that have so much less than me. Um, and when it comes to spiritual matters, we're supposed to look at someone higher than us. We're supposed to look at somebody who has more kindness or more humility or any spiritual trait that we're trying to achieve. We should compare ourselves to somebody who has more than us um, and say, okay, I need to work on myself. I need to, I, I'm, that's what I aspire to be. So, you know, when it comes to having this self-assessment and being self-aware and saying, what in my life do I need? And what in my life can I, um, you know, provide for others? And like we said, that is dependent on each person. But the general rule is that once a person has their, um, their basic needs met, um, then we are obligated to give 10% of our income to tzedakah, um, to charity. So um, just to wrap up, in the beginning, we mentioned that the Talmud says that tzedakah is greater than all of the other mitzvot combined. Um, so what does this mean? How is tzedakah greater than all the other mitzvot combined? Seems like a very extreme thing to say. Um, any ideas? I guess we'll open up and we have time. So let's, does anyone have any thoughts or ideas? How can tzedakah be a mitzvah that is greater than all the other mitzvot combined? What makes, what is so special about this, um, this specific mitzvah? Any thoughts? You're welcome to unmute yourself here. I'll unmute. Yeah, there we go. Are you waiting for me to talk? Yeah, if you if you want. I just think from what you've been saying and you've really um, expressed the message in a way that I never really understood, but it seems like um, the mitzvah of tzedakah really helps to balance the world, which yeah. helps it propel forward brings only goodness and like you were saying it's what Hashem's intention was because I think giving tzedakah not only elevates the receiver but also the giver exactly yeah and I think that's something very special because um it's a very unselfish act yeah that's exactly the point that we have two aspects of tzedakah we said the Rambam's perspective was that it's responding to the need. And that is, of course, to give to the person in need. And on the other hand, Miser is to refine ourselves and to make us more in tune with the needs of another person. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Roseanne. Janet? <laughs> Here, let me unmute you. Okay, am I unmuted now? Yes. Hi. Okay. So my hi. This is very interesting, and and my question is, sort of, if it's giving to the poor, are you going to talk about how now when we give tzedakah to JNF or to cancer research, is that still considered part of my and how did because it's not directly giving to the poor? How has that kind of developed? Yes, great question. So my can be given to. When we say the poor, I mean anyone in need. So any um, organization that is providing for others that have less or need certain things um, is of course considered um, tzedakah. Um, tzedakah comes in very many different forms, many different um, ways of giving tzedakah and giving to organizations um, is definitely um, 
a form of tzedakah for sure. Meiser can actually be given to a poor person. It can be given to an, an organization or an establishment that needs charity, as well as um, there are certain mitzvot that can be, the tzedakah can be used for a mitzvah. So great question, Janet. Exactly um, right. Giving money to, um, you know, cancer research, like you said, or people in need or, um, you know, a community center, all of these things are considered tzedakah for sure. Um, and it says, so basically it says that tzedakah um, brings the redemption, it brings the Messiah. Um, and the reason is very much connected to why tzedakah is like the ultimate mitzvah. Like we said from the, the quote from the Talmud that tzedakah is the the mitzvah. It is the ultimate um, good deed that a person can do. Um, and so in the Tanya, um, which I mentioned, I've mentioned many times before, but the author of the Tanya, the Alter Rebbe, the first Chabad Rebbe, he explains that the purpose of this world, the purpose of um, the Torah and our mission in this world is to elevate the world and make it a more God- um, God conscious place, a place where we can feel um, and see godliness revealed in our life, a place where God feels comfortable, a place that is like a home for God. Meaning when we elevate the physical world, we bring God down into this world. And every single mitzvah in its own right elevates this world. That's why mitzvot, we use physical objects when we do a mitzvah because we are elevating the physicality of this world um, and using it for a godly purpose. And tzedakah is the epitome of this because in any other mitzvah, we use one object or one aspect of our self and we elevate it. So when a person um, studies Torah, they are elevating their mind. When a person you know, does um, celebrate Shabbat, uh, having a Shabbat meal, we are elevating the food that we're eating and we're elevating, um, you know, the challah and the wine, all the physical objects that we use for mitzvot are being elevated when we use them for a godly purpose. Um, but what makes tzedakah stand out from all the other mitzvot is that money is something that a person invests all aspects of their life into, right? We invest so many different aspects of ourself into making a living out from, you know, all of our talents and our, in, our mind, our intellect, um, our abilities, we invest time and energy and um, so much of our life, so much of our day is invested, excuse me, in making a livelihood. And so when a person gives some of that money, that money that they earned with so many different aspects of themselves, they worked so many different parts of themselves to achieve that money and you take it and you give it away to another person, you're not only elevating the money and you know providing for someone in need but all of the energies and all of the things that you invested in making money is elevated along with it and so because money is something that encompasses so many different parts of our our life um and it you know it takes so many different aspects of ourselves to earn money and to make a living when we do use that money to give it to others and to provide for another person we are elevating all of those aspects of our life that we're invested in making the money. And so tzedakah has this, this um, advantage over all other mitzvot, whereas all the other mitzvot elevate one specific part of the world. Tzedakah has this like global all-encompassing elevation. And when we pursue tzedakah, when we um, practice kindness and giving to others, um, and like Roseanne said, being selflessness and generosity, the elevation that that causes um, is so powerful and it really brings God down into this world in a way that no other mitzvah can achieve. Um, and so therefore it's fulfilling our purpose in this world and um, bringing the redemption. Um, as well, we know, we, we know that the idea of Messiah, the idea of Mashiach and um, the future redemption is that the world is going to be a place where only goodness um, is, is accessible. There's only going to be godliness and 
holiness in this world and all the evil and the pain is going to be obliterated. And so when we refine ourselves, when we refine our personal self um, and our personal life, that is a step towards the redemption because if every single person were to refine their own life and refine themselves and make themselves more God conscious, then collectively we would bring the redemption all together with each person did their part to make this world a better place. That as a whole collectively would bring the, will bring the redemption. And so tzedakah, like we said, it refines the giver and the person that is receiving. It gives to the to the receiver and it also refines the giver and makes us more God conscious, humble um, human beings. And so that is the first step towards redemption, having your own personal refinement, your own personal um, redemption is how we achieve a large collective redemption. Um, yes, Janet. Here, I'll ask. So this begs the question, which I'm sure is, is not an easy answer. Um, what if the charity or someone knows that this money has been acquired in an illegal ma manner or not a good thing. Are they still able to accept it? Is it still that we don't judge the other person and we still accept the money? How does that all work? Or do um, you know? <laughs> um, you're saying if the person who's receiving knows that it was acquired in, in like a dishonest way? Correct, either the person or, you know, in our day and age, an organization. Right. It's a great question. Um, I don't know the exact um, answer to that, if it would be allowed um, to accept the money knowing that it was um, acquired in a dishonest way. Um, I could definitely find out and get back to you, but um, I don't wanna say anything yeah. <laughs> without knowing for sure. So I, I don't know. It's a, fascinating question and definitely worth looking into, but I'm happy to look into it for you and see what, what's a great question. Thank uh, thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, so the idea, when the Torah tells us to give miser, to give tzedakah, um, the words that it uses, it says aser to aser, which means, literally means tithes, you should tithe. Um, which is a bit redundant to this kind of wording is a bit redundant. And we know that the Torah never uses an extra word. And so the rabbis ask, um, why, why does the Torah use this, this phrase? My sir, ty sir, you should tithe your tithes. Um, what is, what is it implying here? And so the rabbis explain that the word taser, if you change the, the sin into a shin, it actually reads as tasher, which means um, wealth. And it says, if you read it from this, you know, from this perspective, it means you should tithe in order to become wealthy. If a person tithes, um, they will achieve wealth. And this, of course, refers to physical wealth as well as spiritual wealth. All of the spiritual benefits um, and refinement that a person achieves through giving to another person um, in a way there it's like so much greater than just the money that was given away because what a person can achieve through giving to another person um both personally and you know what you're affecting with the other person is so much more powerful than the money on its own or just those possessions that you had on on their own and so when a person um gives gives my sorry gives that 10 percent away God is promising that person that they will become wealthy, both physically, right? God will bestow on them um, rewards and um, blessings in this world, um, both physical blessings as well as spiritual blessings like we spoke about. And so the power of tzedakah is, I think, more than we can imagine. Um, and it's something that that really affects us as people. When we, I mentioned this last week, but just the idea of giving even a coin every single day to charity, it could be the tiniest amount, but it's not necessarily about the amount. It's about the act of giving, which refines the person 
um, to exercise their generosity muscle, right? To when a person gets into the habit of giving charity daily, even if it's just a coin, um, that person is implementing generosity into their daily life and working on their aspect of kindness. Um, so it's a really, I think that's like, it's a pretty simple thing to do, but it's something that has an incredible effect when a person wakes up in the morning and if anyone has like a charity box at home um, to put a coin into the charity box daily um, is something that's really powerful because it's just a simple act, but it's something that the significance behind it is um, so powerful as we have just spoken. Um, yeah, so if anyone has any other questions or would like to share, I see in the chat, um, we emulate God's compassion by being a giver. That's exactly correct. Um, God is the ultimate giver. And so when we give to others, we are emulating God in a sense. Yes. Um, yeah, we balance the world. That's the idea that God created an imbalanced world, not for it to stay imbalanced, but to give us the opportunity to balance it out and to um, do acts of kindness that make this world a better place. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Thank you ladies for joining. Um, it's been a pleasure um, and an honor as always to learn with you on Wednesday mornings. So um, I think next week due to Thanksgiving, there won't be a class. Um, there may be a Hanukkah class, but we will, I think, resume this course um, on December 23rd is the next Wednesday that we'll continue with this course. But it's possible that we'll have other ladies um, classes pertaining to Hanukkah specifically um, within the next couple weeks. So yeah, the next class is December of this course. So um, thank you, ladies. It's been an honor and have a wonderful day. <laughs> Bye, Rosanna. Bye, sweetheart. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.